In this video, we're going to continue our examination of protein conformation by looking at polypeptide tertiary structure. Previously, we've seen that at the first level, primary structure, we had the unique amino acid sequence of a particular polypeptide. At the secondary structure, that unique sequence was folded into predictable conformations, standard conformations like the alpha helix, as a result of hydrogen bonding associated with the polypeptide's backbone. Now here in the tertiary structure, we're going to see a more elaborate folding of the polypeptide based on interactions between amino acid side chains. Okay? So if we look at our secondary structure, and here we have an alpha helix structure, in the tertiary structure, one of the things we're frequently doing is taking that secondary structure and folding it. So we're taking a folded primary structure and further folding it into a new conformation. You want to keep in mind most actual polypeptides are quite long and consist of more than just a simple singular alpha helix bent. So let's take this particular structure into the context of a full polypeptide in its final tertiary conformation. We have the primary and secondary structures seen here folded into even more elaborate conformations. And each conformation is unique to the particular protein because the forces holding this structure together are related to the specific amino acid side chains that are present in the order that they're present. Notice in this structure, you can still see alpha helices. You probably can even spot some areas that resemble beta sheets. The reality is we have the final tertiary structure of this polypeptide as a result of folding of the folding. Again, all of this folding is held together by interactions either between amino acid side chains with other side chains or interactions between amino acid side chains and the surrounding environment, which remember in the human body is always dominated by water. So let's start with an example like this one. Here we have the amino acid threonine, which you can see has a hydroxyl group in its side chain. This is a hydrophilic or polar amino acid that would be able to hydrogen bond with water molecules around the polypeptide. Alternatively, you could bring in another amino acid somewhere in the chain, like serine here, and the two side chains could form a hydrogen bond with each other. Keep in mind, to keep these diagrams simple, I'm not showing the amino acids as part of an actual polypeptide chain, but that's what would happen in a real polypeptide. They'd be part of the chain, and their bonding with each other or with water would cause twists and kinks in the overall structure as the bonds form. Besides hydrogen bonding, we can also see what's called hydrophobic exclusion. Here we see phenylalanine and alanine, two hydrophobic or nonpolar amino acids that are unable to hydrogen bond with water in their environment. And so these amino acid side chains tend to cluster together as they move away from the water in the surrounding environment. Again, this movement of hydrophobic or nonpolar side chains together causes bends and twists in the overall polypeptide. In the case of the amino acid cysteine, we have a sulfhydryl group present in the side chain. The sulfhydryl groups can engage in hydrogen bonding, but if you get two sulfhydryl groups together, they can form a very strong double bond called a disulfide bridge. This double bond, when it forms, creates a very powerful stability within that part of the polypeptide chain, and it's going to cause some substantial folding. Finally, ionic bonding can occur. In this case, we have glutamic acid on the left and glutamine on the right, glutamic acid being an amino acid with an acidic or carboxyl group in its side chain, and glutamine having an amino group, so acting as a basic uh, side chain. Recall that when these side chains ionize, they develop opposite charges, and opposite charges attract. That opposite charge attraction is an ionic bond, which adds additional stability to the tertiary structure. The take home here, though, is really simple. We have these unique protein amino acid sequences within the polypeptide at the primary structure. They get twisted into the alpha helices and beta sheets at the secondary structure due to hydrogen bonding. But at the tertiary level, the side chains start interacting with each other and with the environment, forming hydrogen bonds 
hydrophobic exclusions, covalent bonds in the form of disulfide bridges, and ionic bonds involving acidic and basic side chains, such that we get these very elaborate and complex structures that are the tertiary structure of the polypeptide. Now, for an individual polypeptide, we're done. But for most functional proteins, they don't consist of one polypeptide. They consist of more than one, which leads us in our next video to the quaternary structure of proteins.